just a, a map to show you how big the city is and, and really um, the Northeast division where Africa Center is, Northeast goes from 97th Street all the way east to Sherwood Park and all the way up at the top would be like St. Albert and then um, the bottom end of the Northeast division where you guys are would be 112th Avenue. This is a model of, of Northwest, not where you are, but that's just to show you the size. And in that size, there's probably only um, at any given time up to maybe 16 police officers patrolling that area. And that's when there's two squads on. There's certain times of the day that there's only two or sorry, one squad on and you'll have maybe eight to 10 officers. Uh, this is a video that's not going to play. So I will try and find it and send it to you later. This, there. So this is just a photo to show you what police officers in Edmonton look like. Uh, the lone picture of the female officer on the right there, that's Constable Amal Abdi. She's wearing our everyday street uniform. So that's what patrol officers wear. That's what I'm wearing right now. Um, so if those are usually the kind of police officers that most people would see. On the left, on my left, is our dress uniform. And that's a recruit graduation ceremony there. We call that a tunic. So we wear that for special occasions, weddings, funerals, uh, parades, that kind of thing. We also don't wear our weapon with that one. There's no, no tools or anything. And on the bottom, is, on the bottom left there is the RCMP. So the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. And I wanted to point out a couple of differences between our uniforms. The biggest one that you might be able to notice when you look at that picture is on the RCMP, they have a yellow stripe on their hats. And for the city police, we have a red stripe. So the difference means that red means municipal for only city police officers. So Calgary, Lethbridge, Medicine Hat, they would all have a red stripe. Anything that's federal or national has a yellow stripe. The RCMP work across Canada, so they have a yellow stripe. But also, so does the CN police, the Canadian National, yeah, Canadian National uh, for the Railway. They also have a yellow stripe. Oops. Oh, sorry. Oh no. There we go. Sorry, my son's texting me. <laughs> and then, in case you didn't know. Anybody could be a police officer. You don't have to be a Canadian citizen. You can also be a permanent resident. You just have to be the, over the age of 18 and you have to have a valid class five driver's license. Um, and you have to have uh, your high school education or two years of post-secondary. And then there's some tests that you have to do. So a written test, a fitness test, um, an interview, with one person and then an interview with a panel, uh, a polygraph test, so a lie detector test, and um, a physical. So those, those are some of the things that you have to do. It's about eight to 10 steps in total, but it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter what gender you are or what race or what religion will take you as long as you have good quality character. Maybe some of you remember Harpreet in the top left. He was in this job before me, but he actually went back to Vancouver. These are some of the vehicles that you might see around town. Uh, mostly all of us drive the SUVs in the top right corner. We used to have Crown Victorias, which were um, four door cars. They're really big, kind of like a boat, uh, but now we all drive the SUVs. And in the top left, we have a canine vehicle and the, there is no back seat in the canine vehicle because the whole back of the truck there is for the dog. And there's a fan to keep them cool. There's a heater to keep them warm. There's water and food and a bed in there. It's kind of cool, but the, no, no prisoners ever go in the back. In the center is our helicopter. We just got a new one because the other one is uh, phasing out and uh, I think it, it's cost too much to repair. So we did fundraise and get a new one. And then there's the motorcycle cops. Those are traffic guys, which I personally could never be because I couldn't write a ticket. I hate it. Um, and then on the bottom right is 
some of our beat cops and our police officers here in Edmonton, we ride our bikes all year round when we're on the beat, even outside in the winter. <laughs> and this picture is just to show you that there's different kinds of law enforcement uh, in Alberta, Edmonton. We have Alberta sheriffs. The sheriffs work in the courthouse and they work on the highways. They work in the jails. Sheriffs have a blue stripe because they're provincial. So red is municipal, yellow is federal, and uh, blue is provincial. We also have peace officers. Uh, they work in parks, they work in the transit, they work downtown, you might see that some of them. They have the authority to arrest if need be, on, only on certain offenses, but they have to turn that person over to a police officer as soon as possible. And there's a few tickets that they can write as well. And in the bottom right is security. Um, I'm sure you've seen the folks that walk around uh, West Edmonton Mall or even Londonderry Mall or city center. They hire private security there. Sometimes they get confused with us. This is some of the ways that you can get in touch with the police. 911, obviously, for emergencies. We also have the complaint line, the 780 Four two three four five six seven. So nine one one, you would phone in case of emergency, which is uh, something bad is happening right now. Somebody's in danger. The complaint line would be the number that you would phone if uh, you woke up in the morning and someone stole your car. It's not an emergency. You don't know when it happened. It's still something. It's still a crime, and you need to report it. So you could call the non-emergency line. There's also Crime Stoppers, which is an anonymous way to report a crime. Uh, we also have social media that you can communicate with us, but you can't report anything on social media like Facebook or Instagram or Twitter because it's not monitored 24 seven. We do have some community engagement officers that work in each division and some beat officers. That's also another resource for you. So just back to the 911, you might need to call 911 in an emergency. And the first thing that they say to you when you call is what do you need police, fire, or ambulance. And you have to be able to tell them which one that you need. And from there, the dispatcher will send it over to whatever, whichever department that you need. If you're unable to communicate or talk, they'll send all three. Usually the police will go first and see what's happening and then we'll relay to fire or EMS if it's safe for them to come in. So, it's, if I was in the classroom with you right now, I would ask you, has anybody had to call 911 before? Um, obviously I can't, but when you call, the operator will ask you, what do you need, police, fire, ambulance? The next question they'll ask you is, who are you? Like who's calling and then who needs help? They will ask you, where are you? So you need to be able to give your address of the location where you're at and not everybody knows their address all the time. So a good thing to learn is uh, we call it landmarking. So if you are at Northgate Mall and you need to call 911, you could say, I'm at Northgate by Safeway or I'm at Northgate by Walmart. Or you could say, I'm at the Northgate Transit Terminal and that's across the street. The evaluator also needs to know what the emergency is. They need to know when it happened and they need to know if there's any weapons. So if it didn't happen right away or like immediately, if it happened yesterday, it's not a 911 call. And then those non-emergency calls, we also use the word complaint line, but it's interchangeable. So non-emergency would be stolen property, damage to property, a break and enter, a stolen car, a collision, or fraud. And there's even some of those that you can report online. Uh, mischief to a property, graffiti, a break into a garage, that can be reported online. A stolen car has to be reported to the complaint line. And just so you know, because it's winter season, uh, collisions, the damage has to be more than $2,000 when reporting a collision to police. If it's less than $2,000, you actually don't have to report it to us. Of course, not everybody's a mechanic, so it's hard to tell, 
you're always allowed to get an estimate first. So if you had to report something to the police and we came to talk to you, just a couple of notes about what, how to make that easier for you. Speaking with the police, we ask that you make eye contact. Um, this shows respect. And I'm, I am aware that in some countries, uh, it's a sign of respect to not make eye contact. But here in Canada, if you didn't make eye contact, a lot of the time people think that you're hiding something or that you're being dishonest. So that next point there is to be honest. Even if you broke the law or just made a bad decision, if you're honest about it, it's easier, us to, easier for us to try and fix it with you. And also you can't bribe or assault a police officer. So that means you can't try to give us money or say, uh, if you own a restaurant, say, I'll feed you, come, come to my restaurant and I'll feed you and don't give me a ticket. We can't do that. You also can't put your hands on an officer because that gets you in trouble. You shouldn't, if you actually shouldn't put hands on anybody if you're fighting with them. So criminal law, criminal laws are the same across Canada and they're enforced by the police. If you were to break the law in Canada, you can face jail time and have a criminal record. Here in Canada, there is no such thing as torture or capital punishment. So that means if you stole something, we wouldn't cut off your hand. Um, we don't execute people. We don't hang them or give them the electric chair or anything like that here in Canada. The biggest punishment that you could have would be 25 years to life in prison. And the other thing that's different about Canada is that you're innocent and proven, until proven guilty. Some of the most common types of laws that get broken are assault. So that's the top left, the guy hitting the other guy with a piece of wood, I think. Um, assault could be slapping, punching, biting, spitting. Uh, it doesn't always have to be someone getting hit with a weapon. And then to the right of that is a bad guy trying to break into a car and steal from the car, so that's theft. And then in the bottom left, is fraud. That is something that happens quite often, especially uh, with the um, Canada Revenue Agency and the, those fake phone calls that happen. And they, they say they're going to arrest you if you don't pay a certain amount of money. Canada Revenue in real life never phones you. So if you ever get those phone calls, the best thing to do would be to just hang up. And then on the bottom right, there is drug possession and trafficking. Um, we now, marijuana is now legal here in Canada. So at home, you're allowed to have as much as you want. If you're out on the street or driving around, the most that you can have is 30 grams. And then the rest of those pills there, they're not allowed. That would be like um, ecstasy and heroin and cocaine. Those are all still illegal. So this is domestic violence and we were, kind of supposed to talk about that a lot today. Domestic violence is any use of physical or sexual force, actual or threatened in an intimate relationship. So for our definition from the police service, an intimate relationship is, uh, is not just people who are married to one another. It could be husband and wife, but it could also be boyfriend and girlfriend. It could be, um, father, daughter, mother, son. It could even be siblings in the same house. And if you're a boyfriend and girlfriend and you don't live together, but you have a fight, that still for us is domestic violence. So the important thing to note is that you do not have to be married to the other person for us to consider it domestic violence. You just have to be in an intimate relationship or like a very close contact relationship, like dating. Some of the abuse that we see and may include physical abuse, which is obvious, kind of obvious, hitting, slapping, punching, kicking. Um, emotional abuse, which would be you're telling your partner that they're no good, or you know their cooking sucks, they're stupid, they're fat, they're ugly. Um, never letting them do things that they want to do. Sometimes not letting them leave the house. Um, telling them that they're unworthy, making them feel terrible. We often also see sexual abuse and consent is really important. So even if you are in a marriage, 
if one person doesn't want to be touched and the other person keeps touching them, that's actually sexual assault. So we always try to make sure that people understand no means no, and it doesn't matter um, married or not, boyfriend, girlfriend, father, daughter, mother, son, brother, sister. If someone, you, you just can't touch someone who doesn't want to be touched. And then the last thing there is financial abuse. And there isn't a law yet about it, but I've, I sit on a, a national committee that's working on having one put in that um, if you withhold money from your partner, that that's considered financial abuse because the person who has all the money has all the power in the relationship. So, um, you know, if wife stays home and, and looks after the kids and husband goes to work and he makes the money and he doesn't share with the wife, and she might have to ask for money to buy milk from the store or buy something for school for the kids or even just for herself. And if he says no, that's financial abuse. The same with um, if the wife gets the child tax credit and all the money from that and the husband has no job and he's looking for a job but he has no job so he has no money. If the wife doesn't share some of the income with him, that's financial abuse. Oh, and the last one there, um, stalking and harassment. This is kind of tricky, but if someone doesn't want to be with you and they say, please leave me alone, you have to leave them alone. And stalking could be maybe you'd go to their place of work or you go to where they go to school and you try and see them or visit them or you creep on their social media profiles like Facebook or Instagram and you send them messages a whole bunch and they've asked you to stop, that's stalking. And when they ask you to stop and you keep doing it, that's considered harassment. And if you continue and they told you to stop, the person can call the police and we can charge for criminal harassment. As long as the victim has made it clear that they want no contact with the other person. And, and stalking too or harassment could be, um, me phoning my ex-boyfriend over and over and over again, telling him that I want to get back together. If he told me to stop and leave him alone, I'm now considered to be stalking that person. So again, it doesn't matter what the community that you're from, what the rules are back home. Here in Canada, um, people are not possessions and so Abuse is wrong in any language, and we don't have the right to hurt somebody in our family, to control them, to keep them in line, to teach them a lesson. We can't hit people. We can't use our shoe. Um, like I've heard sometimes Somali moms like to do. I'm just kidding. Um, or we can't, we can't use a broom on someone. We can't use a belt. Uh, when I was a little kid, my mom liked to use the wooden spoon on my butt and uh, until one day it broke and uh, I teased her and said like, is that all you got? Um, but anyway, you're, you're not actually supposed to do that. So if something like that happened in your house and police were called, here are some things that we like to share with you. That if you made a bad decision and you broke the law, the police may detain you and ask you questions, but you're free to go. If the police arrest you, they would put handcuffs on you and you're not free to go. So if I come to your house and usually we separate the parties, like the, the two people that are involved in the altercation and we ask them each their side of the story. Um, if one person confesses and tells us, yes, I hit them, then I, can, I have grounds to arrest. Uh, if they say I didn't do anything, but the other person has an injury like a black eye or a bleeding nose or something like that, well, that's kind of hard to give to yourself. It's hard to assault yourself that way. So I would probably arrest the other person if I saw that kind of evidence. Um, if police charge you, that means that you were gonna go to court and have a day in court to explain to a judge what happened, so your side of the story. Even if we charge you, it doesn't mean that you go to jail. And you certainly won't go to jail on that day. And if 
unless it's domestic violence related and I need to ask a judge to enforce some conditions, which would be conditions are no contact with the victim, no going to that address. Uh, sometimes if drugs or alcohol involved in when the person made the bad decision, we would say, we would ask the judge to grant a condition of no alcohol or drugs. Um, but even through all of that, you always have the right to a lawyer. So if you don't have a lawyer, when, I, when we arrest you, the first thing that we do is read you your charter and caution. And in the charter and caution, we ask you, do you want to call a lawyer, a free lawyer or any other lawyer? So if you don't have a lawyer that you would use, I don't have a lawyer that I have on standby, we would give you the number to legal aid and that, that card is on the top, or in the bottom right corner there. So if something bad happened to you and say you didn't speak English, the first thing that we would do is try and get you an interpreter. Uh, we try not to ask other family members to be the interpreter. We try not to ask children in the home to be an interpreter. Uh, in an emergency situation, we try to act as quickly as possible, but it does take a while sometimes to, to call on our radio to ask for someone else to show, to come to this, our call or our scene, the location that speaks that language. And, um, you know, we have a few Arabic speaking members, but I know for a fact we have no Tigranian speaking members. So if we were to look for a specialized language, it takes us just a little bit longer. And sometimes we have to utilize the language line. Um, we would also, if it was a serious assault, we would probably ask you to do a videotaped interview. So we would bring you back to the police station and we would tell you, um, that we would give you the charter, tell you that um, we don't want you to lie. That's basically what it says. And then it's an offense to lie. And then we would just ask you some questions um, in your own words, tell us what happened kind of thing. If that occurrence ended up going to court and you weren't able to testify, or sometimes people recant, and the word recant means um, take, like, take it back. They, they take back their statement and say, no, I don't wanna say that anymore. We would just use the video instead. We would also hook you up with victim services. Um, we, we call them crime trauma informed support services now. Uh, so I have to update my slide, but there is some folks that work in there that can help connect people to extra resources like, um, victims of crime benefit and uh, maybe psychological services. So there's the last few slides are just things that I wanted to make sure that you guys were aware of because these are ones that happen all the time. So Canada Revenue Agency, the scam, sometimes fake letters or emails are sent to people asking for information, personal information or asking for gift cards Canada Revenue doesn't do that. They don't ever ask for gift cards. They already have your personal information. That's a scam, or we use the word phishing. Do not open any of the attachments that come with those emails. Quite often, they are attachments that put spyware on your computers and corrupt your computers. This happened to my parents, even though I've told them several times, don't open emails from people you don't know. Uh, my parents did and spyware was downloaded and that the people could use the camera on their computer to see them, which is really uncomfortable. <laughs> if someone calls you on the phone, don't give out any of your personal information. Don't tell them that you'll go get gift cards. Don't tell them what your birthday is or your SIN number. They are just phishing and asking for information so that they can commit identity fraud. And if you're ever unsure, you can just contact Canada Revenue Agency. Um, I'm not sure who drives in this room, but if you were to drive in Alberta, the province of Alberta, you need a valid driver's license. Uh, this one here is a class five, and I'll tell you what the difference is. So under the Alberta Traffic Safety Act, the first step is to obtain a class seven learner's permit um, you can do that by going into any registry and it's a, a computer test that you do and they, they have them in different languages as well. It's like a knowledge, knowledge test of driving. For you to practice driving though, you must be supervised by someone who has a full class five driver's license. 
And once you get enough supervision and you want to take your test for your class five, the test is a driving test or so road test. You have to have had your class seven for a full year. Um, and also with your class seven, you can't drive between the hours of 12 a.m. and 5 a.m. And you're only allowed eight demerit points. And demerit points are those things that come, sometimes you get a ticket and you have to pay a fine. Sometimes those tickets also have demerit points. Uh, step two is your class five GDL. So GDL stands for graduated driving license. You have to be at least 18 to get your GDL. Um, no, that's wrong, sorry. Cause I'm thinking, I'm looking at my own children who are not, it's not that one, your, your full class five is at 18. Um, anyway, sorry about that. You have to be Canadian or permanent resident. Uh, you have to have a work visa or approved refugee claim. You have to do the road test, which is about half an hour. With your class five GDL, you cannot supervise a class seven and you have to have your license for two years before a full class five. And then class five is you, you're on the two years before you can test, no license suspensive, suspensions and you have to take your advanced road test. There's no limit on the amount of time that you can stay as a class five GDL. So just some rules that I'm sure everybody knows, but it's worth reminding. Everybody in Alberta has to wear a seatbelt. Um, it's the law, it's a $115 ticket if you're not wearing a seatbelt. All your passengers have to have seatbelts and your kids have to be in car seats. So just speaking of car seats, car seats are not assigned by age, they're assigned by weight. So the rear facing, the little bucket seat on the, the first one on the far left, that's for usually up to 20 pounds, but some of them can go up to 40 pounds, depending on how big they are. Um, oh. My dog is gonna go nuts in a second. I'll just hit mute if he barks. Um, the one in the middle is forward facing. So that's about 22 pounds to 65 pounds. And then the booster seat on the far right is can be from 40 pounds up to 80 pounds. That's not by age. Again, it's just by how much your child weighs. And distracted driving, this ticket went up recently. I think it's $300. Um, that's, we all know we're not supposed to drive and talk on our phones or text and talk on our phones, but it also means not doing our hair, not brushing our teeth, not shaving, which is all things that I've personally seen. If you get stopped by the police, you need to stay calm and pull your vehicle over to the right. Do not get out of the car. Place your hands on the steering wheel. And when the police come to your window, they will ask you for your license, insurance and registration. And you could just tell them, my insurance or my registration is in the glove box. Can I get it? And they'll say yes. And then you just get it and you hand it to them. The reason why we ask you to stay in the car and show us your hands is because quite often bad guys who are out there driving will have guns or knives or some other kind of weapon. Um, so we're just, we're trained to look for your hands and be able to see them. And once we can see your hands, we know that you're safe. So you need insurance and registration to drive the vehicle. Registration you get from the registry, the same place where you get your class seven, but the insurance company is private. So you can shop around and get insurance from whatever company that you'd like. If you didn't have a ticket though, or you didn't have insurance and you got a ticket, it can be almost $3,000. <coughs> jaywalking, I know it's super tempting, but jaywalking is actually $250 for a ticket. I mean, we don't give them out very often, but it does happen. And that is it. Oh, there's so many people. I didn't see you all before. Does anybody have any questions for me? Uh, hi, Jackie. This is Ali Mahdi. How are you? I'm good, Ali. Nice to hear from you. Good. Okay. I want to ask you the, some of the apartment if in case that there is, they need interpretation, okay? Interpretation? Yes, it's okay. I, uh, uh, Somalia, you have a question about the captain 
o ad kuşe geçen İngiliz ama ve haddi ad İngiliz ad Rabin o lugadina ajaa shahan ajaa shihin I mean qof Allah qof ka isdehisin meesha oo joogo indu u sheega maxaa yeelay hawshan booliska waa wax muhiim ah way waxa way ilmaha discipline but traffic the ticket ka j walking discipline the merit point waxaan waa waxyaabo oo nagu cusub way iyo wixi kale oo ad qabtaan haji go guliga laga bixiyay macna wax xun marka da su'aal qabtaan opportunity way ee qofta ay joogto allo weydiyo assalamu alaykum adadu baahantiina anaga isheeg ana u sheega hadii qofka dad kale u jirana u sheega thank you It's a very shy group tonight. Okay, I will ask you, and I, I, I think they want uh, uh, someone to start, you know. Uh, okay, you, you, okay, sometimes the, the problem that some uh, newcomers like me have is that uh, disciplining our children. So we have our own culture, but here also, if you are in Rome, you have to do as the Romans do, right? So you have to do that like the Canadian. So what is the acceptable that is not gonna say this is, you are going too much, you know, for your child. If the child is not listening, is not behaving, the dad is one boy. If my child, the teenage, 14, 15, that doesn't come home the time that he or she, after 10 o'clock, where to call? Do I have to call 911? Do I have to call the, the police? That's also another common thing that happened. Families, they, oh, my daughter is not at home. My son is not at home. So then when do we, when do we want to call the police if the child is not coming home, like 11 p.m.? Go ahead. Right. Thank you. So your first question, um, how, when you're disciplining, how can you discipline? The general rule of thumb is if you're going to use physical punishment, you cannot leave a mark. So if I'm going to spank my three-year-old or my four-year-old on the bum for doing something bad, and I want to correct the behavior, I can give them a little tap like that but I can't wind up and hold on to their shirt and wind up like this and smack so hard that I leave fingerprints on the bum because that's assault. So you, you can smack a hand to say no, you can smack the bum, but you can't do it so hard that you leave a mark. And you can do that when they're younger, but when you're looking at a maybe 11, 12, 13 year old, you, there's no reason to use physical force. You have words. And it's about using your words to tell them uh, no, but also work through that conflict with them and maybe trying to understand why they're making the bad choices that they're making. If your child is 14, 15, 16, and they say they're going to the mall after school and then they don't come home at night, uh, it's 10, 30, 11 o'clock and you're worried about them, you can phone the police and report them as missing. You don't have to wait the 24 hours. But the thing is, we, we, would, um, have, we would only look for them in the places that you tell us where they think they might be. We would send maybe, if you had a picture of them, we would send that picture out to the Edmonton Transit so all the bus drivers could see it and the peace officers could see it. So if they came across your child, we would go look at the malls, we would go look at the park. We would go look in places that you suggested, maybe Clairview Rec Center or the Africa Center, the basketball, basketball courts. But it's not a crime for them to be out late. So there's nothing that we can do for enforcement to punish them. That's something that you would have to do as a parent. So quite often I recommend grounding the child or taking away some of their privileges, like maybe their uh, if they play video games, you could take away the, the time that they're allowed on the video game. Um, when my kids were teenagers and causing trouble, uh, I used to take the modem that 
that brought the internet into the house, I would take that to work with me. So they were only allowed on the computer when I was home. If they came home from school and I wasn't there, they had to do chores or read a book or play outside. Like it wasn't, wasn't fun for them, but um, it was a way for me to help them understand that if they're bad choices that they make have consequences. I know that Ali, when you said, you know, when in Rome or you have different cultural practices, the laws here in Canada are not, uh, not great. So your child at age 16 is actually allowed to live on their own. They're allowed to sign their own permission slips for school and they are allowed to see the doctor by themselves um, and, and they don't have to have a parent consent for that kind of stuff. I try not to tell kids that because I don't want them running off to live on their own because the world is not a very nice place sometimes, especially when you're 15, 16 or 16 years old. Um, we'd like to have kids stay at home as long as possible, but we can't force them to be there. Does that answer your question? Thank you very much. Yes. I give you a little bit of time. I'm not sure. Okay, go ahead. Away. Kofka had the, for example, on what a Gariga has insurance could do, and again, insurance could do it. Had the leg up to Mahalo Semena. Good. Jackie? Yes. The question is a wife is asking if he is driving his wife's car and the car is under the name of the wife and the insurance, but he is driving the car. If the, the police is with him, what will happen? Nothing. As long as he has a valid driver's license and the insurance and registration is valid, it doesn't matter whose name that part is. It's okay if the insurance and registration is in his wife's name, as long as it's valid. But, but, but usually they have to have the same address, right? They should be living the same house or they could be living in different places. They can live in different places. So sometimes um, I would let my son, who's 24, drive my truck when he was moving into his new house. And so we don't have the same address anymore on our driver's licenses. But as long as the vehicle is insured and registered, that's okay. Okay. Uh, well, we see the, the reason why I'm here. I'm Madame Insurance. Adam Kabil. Ha. Okay. okay. Jackie? Yes. The question is that he was new to Canada and he was the driving of his car, of, of his wife's car. And the police okay. at the time who stopped him. Because maybe you, I, I know the police are also human. He he got it. He was issued a ticket because of not having an insurance, even though the car was insured under the name of his wife. Okay, so in that case, if the car is insured, you have the right to go to court and argue it. Just because a police officer gave you a ticket doesn't mean that you're guilty. So, I mean, you might've paid the ticket already, but if you haven't yet, I would make an appointment for a trial date. And then you would take the, a copy of your insurance, even if it has your wife's name and the ticket. And you could tell the judge that I was driving this car, but it was insured under my wife's name. I was with هذه هذا المحكمة ده هذا هذا نقول التيكت كيف بيعلن حقه حول هذا إن إن قادو إنشورن تيجي أو المحكمة ده كورت تيجي عادي عادي because what is important is that the car on the road is insured مين جو حواي إن الجاريجا جيت كمرة on the road إنه هيلت إنشورن and the car has 
the blood number is Liga. ما قلت مركا حق بقول لها إنها كأن دعوته قد نموش يجين وكا عايه وان بحي محاترة توتو السبنتين كي أهد جايت كان مركا قلت أوكي شو نصيغة وحي ناكتا وحي أوتري أو ماشا العكت لغو بحي محاترة جايت كا حاسكا أوكي سوي حالة فاقة قلت واي عديق ما عدي ما يا مركا سانيق مجون حاسكا تكتب حالة قفا قلت واي قارئ من شروس الآن هو. المحكمة دي كم باقته نو؟ المحكمة دي اللي هلا كم باقته؟ أنا مركز مركز صار عذر دار الله ما لكم. آه وأوجا أوكي. جاكي إيد إت هابن، but in the future if they get the ticket they have to go the time between the whatever thirty days they have to go to to the court to see the judge right? Is that the case? Yeah. So on the front of the ticket. <clears throat> the little yellow ticket about two-thirds down would be the court date as long as you go to the courthouse on or before that date to go and ask for a trial um the, you're, you're okay if you go with like the next day the ticket won't be there because the police officer has to make notes on the back of it he has to submit it at his station and his boss has to make sure it's right and then it has to go in the mail down to headquarters and then the mail over to the courthouse. So it takes a couple weeks, but the court date is usually six weeks after the ticket. So you have some time. If you went in about a month, that would be okay. Okay. Okay. Okay. Any other question? Gabdo, you will. Madam, today, Jackie, okay, so at EBS, I never joked. What kind of questions? Okay, so anything about the police? Hi, Jackie. It's me. How are you? Good. It's nice to see you. Nice to see you. Finally, we'll have to get in touch afterwards. Okay. <laughs> um, just wanted to um. To confirm what you said, because I once got a ticket for uh, $600 and <sighs> yes, and the police officer actually, unfortunately, he had lied. Um, he said that I was trying to pass across a road a line where um, a pedestrian was in the middle of the street and that I was going to hit her. Whereas in reality, the person was on the sidewalk. I only saw her after passing a big truck. And I even waved at her and I said, I am sorry. Like, I apologize. She nodded, you know, whatever. And I left, but he came after me. Anyway, um, I did go to court as because a lot of people told me to contest it, like you said. And I did. And the judge saw that I was not lying, that there was actually the police officer who lied because he wanted, I think he was new or something and wanted to impress. It was the new law that came for $600, you know, if yeah. you press across line. So um, what I wanted to say to the community is that it is true when you go to court, um, you have a big chance of winning um, because the judges see the other point of the person and it is, um, it's important to, to go and try to contest it. So, um, but I am also surprised at what you said because my daughter is just got her license and she wants to drive my car and I'm going, no, you have no insurance. And the insurance company told me not to let her drive the car until she has insurance. So now I'm going, is that true or not true? Like who is... <laughs> It, it depends on what kind of insurance package you put on the car. Oh, so if that's the, another layer to complicate it. Like um, I have insurance on my car. I pay a little bit extra so that my kids can drive it. Whereas maybe sometimes in some families they choose not to because uh, if, my, if my son who's 20 has a car accident with my car, my insurance will go up because young yeah. adult males are high risk yeah true so for my my kids they have their own cars now and they pay for their own insurance on their own cars and i took that extra insurance off of my car because they have their own so 
if the husband and wife are sharing the car and they're both over the age of 25, they're in the same risk category. Um, so it wouldn't be more expensive to let the other person drive, but it really, it depends on what kind of insurance you buy. Okay. And okay. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good to know. Thanks. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you. I did send a hate crime. If there's a, if there's other questions, I'm cool to take more questions, but I did send a hate crimes video, um, over to Anna just in case, because I thought hate crimes was something else that <laughs> you wanted to talk about. Yes. I'll take other questions though. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, we see Munira. I don't know if Munira has a question. Okay, I guess not. So I am sorry I came in late, so I didn't really follow the beginning. What, uh, what did you tell them? But um, I was wondering if you could talk to us like a little bit about um, family violence and how does it work, um, you know, in the homes, because especially sometimes even family violence happens against men. It's not always against women. Maybe the percentage is higher against women, but it could also happen against men. And I was wondering for men, is there a way, a place to go? Is there anything they need to do? Um, or for women also, like, what to do when there is really I mean, children, I mean, people are, are terrified? So for domestic violence, it does happen against men. You're absolutely correct. But there she's okay, Yeah. Um, and why we see the numbers are higher for females is quite often not because it happens more, but because men don't report it. Men uh, are afraid to report it. And I earlier I talked a little bit about consent. Um, in a relationship, it goes both ways where you can't put your hat, you can't touch someone who doesn't want to be touched. And for men, um, you know, if their, their partner hits them or hits them with a shoe or a broom or yells and screams at them and tells them that they're useless and ugly or fat or I don't know, that's abuse. And it can be reported for us, for the police to charge, we need to have some kind of evidence that a physical assault took place. If someone is just using um, bad words, and saying mean things, that's emotional abuse, there is no criminal charge for that. But we would still help the person find a safe place to go. So I know that IPSA, like Islamic Family Social Services, has a men's group that we would, you know, could refer them to, or we would give them the number to 211, which is a, a resource for all kinds of support. And the person could call 211 on their own or when they felt safe to do so, to ask for help. Me personally, I would probably call the Africa Center and see if there was somebody there that could help or, you know, Catholic Social Services or um, we could Mennonite. give them that. What's that? Mennonite Center? Yeah, the Mennonite Center. So there's lots of support agencies that are better equipped than the police officers are to give that support outside of the, the moment when it happens. because. We have to keep in mind, police are first responders. We come when you call 911. We, we look at the problem and we go, okay, this is what we need to do to make everybody safe. And we typically take out from the home what we call the dominant aggressor. So we don't always say we take the men out or we take the females out. We take out the dominant aggressor. And even if we don't lay charges, we will ask the person who's basically being the bully or making the bad decisions to go somewhere else for the night to make sure that they're safe, just to cool off. So if you need, if you have family that you can go stay with, or you can go rent a room in a hotel, if you really didn't have any other resources, we could take you to a, a drop-in shelter for the night. They're not always the safest, but um, you know, they're uncomfortable because you're in a, in a large group with strangers or a large room to sleep with strangers. So we would, 
do you have any friends? Do you have any coworkers? Do you have any family that you can stay with? And we would give you a ride there just so that everybody cooled off. Okay. Wow. Oh. Interesting. Um, we have a question from Amal. She mentioned in the chat that her mic does not work. And she's okay. saying, uh, if I don't have a Canadian driver license, can I drive with my foreign one? And if I would like to get a Canadian one, how long would that take? So first, can she drive with an international one? I personally know that in the past, there used to be a three months you could drive with an international, but I don't know now if the law has changed. So I'll let you answer the two questions. <laughs> I am Googling right now because I, you're right. It used to be three months for some yeah. and um, not every country Canada, we, we don't allow every country. Oh. So, yeah, it depends on what country you're from. And uh, it then it depends on what province you're in. Because BC, Alberta, Manitoba, Ontario, we all have different driving laws. So here in Alberta, the Traffic Safety Act, the Alberta Traffic Safety Act has a set of rules. But it, it would be different in Ontario. So it, A, it depends right. on what country... I was in uh, in Quebec and they were accepting people from France. Like if you drive in France, you go to Quebec, then you don't need to pass the, the test anymore. They just consider you a Canadian driver right away. But coming from Quebec to Alberta, we I think we had, I don't remember anymore, but I think we had to pass the test. No, we were accepted from Quebec to Alberta. We were accepted, but you're right, some provinces don't accept. Well, Amal, if you can write to us from which country are you, maybe we can help you more. Yeah. So it says on the Alberta, I'm on the Alberta um, USA. Government. Oh, USA? USA. Um, it doesn't say on the list. Um, you might have to take your knowledge test here, like a, a road test here. Okay. Because the countries that it has listed on their website that, that you don't is um, Australia, Austria, Belgium, France, Isle of Man. Like there, it doesn't say the United States. Yeah. If it doesn't say United States, that means you have to do your test here. You have to redo everything here. Yeah. Okay. Do you know how long will it take here? It says, sorry, I'm just going to read the last part here. License sure. holders from the United States can exchange their class five, six, or seven without additional testing requirements. Any class of license other than those in the five, six, and seven must complete all testing requirements. Okay, so Amal, I don't know if you got that. If your driver license is uh, level five, six or seven, you do not have to pass again here. You should go to any Alberta service office and you give them your USA driver license and they will give you a Canadian one. But yeah. for any other one, like I think for trucking or maybe something like that, that, that means you have to repass the test. Um, and how long will it take? It will, it will take you five minutes. You just have to go to any office. That's where you usually get your driver license or you pay a ticket or whatever. You just go there and as you're standing, they will do it for you and then send it to you in the mail. Right, yep. Jackie? Yeah. Yeah. You just need to bring proof of residency, like something with your address. Yeah, any letter, like letter from Epcot or uh, TELUS or any any company, even just the letter addressed to you, that would be enough. Or your passport, right? Yeah. Yeah, anything that has yeah, an address. Yeah, because you have to have... Yeah, uh, and, your, the, and your photo. No, the passport, because the, the, the, the passport doesn't have address. It's something that has address. I oh. did it that I was in Colorado, a student there, and I came here, and I had the, the American, um, I mean, the driver license, I'm, the, the, I'm in Colorado, so I don't have to go through all this, you know, the knowledge test, and it was so smooth. I just went there with my address, and then they changed. 
Okay. Yeah, good to know. So can I tell you guys what a hate crime is? You want to talk about that? Yes, um, Anna had put the, um, I don't know, Anna, can you can we play the video that you sent us now or we can't? I don't know about Zoom, if we can do it so we can discuss it. Yeah, I was, um, maybe Jackie could try. I don't think on mine it would work. But Okay, I'll go back to, I'll just hit share screen again. And website. Nope. Oh. Hang on. Let's see. I bookmark it. I'm trying to play it from the Wait. chat. Yeah. Oops. Sorry. China. I'm not super techie. <laughs> Yeah, take your time. You're not the only one. Yeah. yeah. Are you able to yeah. see that? Yeah. Perfect. Can you hear that? No, we cannot hear it. Hang on. We cannot see anything. No? No, now we can hear but cannot see anything. Oh dear. Okay, that's okay. Okay, I will stop the share. If, yeah, you, if you guys are able to um, click on it from wherever after, you can watch that video. It's about four minutes and it's Sergeant Gary Willits from our hate crimes unit explaining what a hate crime is and the difference between a hate crime and a hate incident. So I'll just tell you from us what a, what a hate crime is and defined by the criminal code. A hate crime is an offense committed against a person or property which is motivated in whole or in part by the suspect's hate, bias, or prejudice towards an identifiable group based on real or perceived race nationality, ethnic origin, language, color, religion, sex, age, mental or physical disability, sexual orientation, or any other simil similar factor. Just a big, broad definition, but some of the examples of that would include violence or threats of violence, yeah, of mischief or vi vandalism, distribution of hate literature or hate mail, threatening phone calls, and or destruction of religious property. If one of these criminal acts occurs and the investigating officer feels that it was motivated by hate, the file would be classified as a hate crime. So we, you need to understand about that is that just because if, if I went and I vandalized the Al Rashid mosque, if I put spray paint on it with funny faces and, and, and I said, um, Jackie was here. That's not a hate crime. That's just mischief. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Okay. But if I went to the mosque and I put a whole bunch of swastikas and I put kill all Muslims, that would be a hate crime. Okay. Interesting. So there's a bit of a difference. 
And same with a, a hate incident is, and this is, it's hard to talk about, but if someone called um, me a bad name or, so I'll use my own family as an example. My, my own children are half Chinese. And if someone called them a derogatory name, like um, chink, if they said, I don't like that kid, he's a chink. That's not a hate crime. It's a hate incident. So because you call somebody a bad name or you say, um, go home all China, Chinese people or um, even President Trump in the beginning of Corona, when he was saying that the, the coronavirus came from China and it's all the Chinese people's fault. It's ignorant, but it's not a hate crime. I, and there's no charge under in the criminal code for hate crime, what it is, is a sentencing, um, a sentencing element. So I would still charge the person for the mischief at the mosque with that painted the swastikas. But in my report, I would say this crime was motivated by hate. And then the crown prosecutor, so the lawyers would ask for extra time in jail for that person because the crime was motivated by hate. What if, someone writes you in a text, um, this population, and they specify the color of skin, and in that case, it was white. So they were going, um, all white people should be, they are trash, and they should be walked all over, and they should be, uh, I don't know what else she said. So what would that be in your opinion? And if we should, you know, report that? Well, it would just be a hate incident if they're just saying mean things about a certain demographic. If they said, um, I really hate Jackie, that white police officer. If I see her, I'm gonna shoot her. Um, that would be a threat and even that would be hard to classify as a hate crime because the person would have to say how much they hate white people and how much they hate me because I'm white. But if they said, I, I don't like her, I'm going to shoot that cop in the head, that's just a threat. It's, it's really tricky to, um, cause it's really tricky to navigate because me personally, I find that those words are more hurtful than the mischief, than the graffiti. I, yeah. I find it, ca it causes me more heartache to hear that someone called someone else the N-word or the, like w something really horrible. I just, I think that causes more damage sometimes. True, true. And, and the best case scenario for that, like say it happened between coworkers at work or even if it happened between high school students, we could give a bullying ticket. Oh, really? Yep. Is this new? No, we've had bullying tickets for a while. We just don't use them very often. Okay. Can you tell us what that is? How do you do that? Like, yeah. seriously, this is amazing. Gosh, if I knew that, I would advertise it for you all over all the schools. <laughs> well, it, they're hard, though. They're hard to prove. That's the only thing. Bullying tickets. Uh, go back page. So we can give a ticket for bullying. It can be reported to their school resource officer, although we don't have school resource officers at the moment. I think it's $250. Wow. Yeah. But when you give a bullying ticket to the kid, who pays that ticket? It's the parent. Yeah. Exactly. So it doesn't always serve its purpose. You should make it uh, to, for, to force, like not force them in the sense of forcing, but instead of paying money to do a community service or, or to go do something with the people that he hurt, bullied or, you know. Yeah, we do have, um, yeah, it's $250. And you can you can pay the ticket or go to court. 
Um, but we do have a new thing called diversion first here in, with the Edmonton Police Service. And uh, my friend Leon Harvey started that program and it's currently right now in West Division and, and I think downtown and it should be at Northeast soon. But that's for bullying, um, assault, like pushing, shoving, punching, um, shoplifting. If it's a kid's first time offense or even their second time offense and some third if we have to, if they really need support instead of putting them through the criminal justice system, we would put them in the Diversion First program and try and keep them out of court. We would set them up with a youth worker from the YMCA and probably a community resource such as Africa Center or Somali Canadian Women and Children or um, Boys and Girls Club. We would set them up with a worker from there to help build their confidence and help them make better decisions so that they, they don't do that again. So for the bullying thing, if between two kids at school, yeah, we would refer them to that as well. If, but if the kid was a chronic bullier and just miserable and wouldn't accept any responsibility, heck, yep, I'm writing the ticket. Okay. Well, do you find that it does do anything? Like, does it really improve them when you make them join other programs? Uh, for some of the kids, yeah, it yeah. does. Because I, I really believe that our, our youth don't want to make bad decisions but they're lacking some kind of support and they're lacking the guidance that they need to help them have the confidence to do the right thing. And a lot of the times that could be, I know it's cliche in a step, but a single parent family or parent has mental health problems, or even maybe the kid has mental health problems and doesn't have the cognitive um, ability to make good decisions. Like there are, there are kids that have ADD, like attention deficit disorder, who don't mean to do malicious things they just make dumb decisions sometimes and is it worth punishing that person because they have a disability i don't think so so we try to look at each individual file or child as an individual and try to find the best way to serve them okay interesting yeah um, or, sorry earlier you mentioned that the bullying ticket is hard to give out what exactly makes it like very hard to like prove or give out well, for me, it's, you have, we would make notes of it and um, it becomes sometimes hearsay. So if I didn't see the bullying happen and I didn't watch child A say bad things to child B, I would have to take statements from the victim and that would become their evidence. So the victim would have to, to tell the judge what happened. And sometimes that's hard when you're a kid. Um, we also... We want to make sure that we've taken all the other steps like diversion, trying to divert them out of the system first. And if none of that worked, then we could give the bullying ticket. But like I said, if they're 16, 15, 16 years old and they're not working, who pays the ticket? The parent. And in that case, if the parent has been allowing this child to have that kind of behavior, sometimes the parent's a bully too. Right, so that's why I just mean there's lots of, I mean, I don't have a problem writing it. It just sometimes gets thrown out at court or the parent wants to argue it and the, the court date ends up happening, you know, six weeks to two months after the offense and then the learning moment is gone. I think that the, the kids sometimes will get to the six month mark or, or sorry, six week mark and forget the words that they used or the damage that happened. The victim won't, but the offender probably would. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a question for you. Yeah. If someone knows, um, I was just listening to some people, they were talking and one girl has a boyfriend and the boyfriend is abusing her, yelling and screaming and like real violence almost in there. But the girl still gives him excuses and says, no, it's okay. He just had a bad day, this, that. And the friends are kind of worried about that girl and they don't know what to do to help her out. Uh, is there anything that could be done because the boy or the guy comes out in front of the parents, in front of everybody as the perfect 
kid, the perfect guy. Like you cannot think anything bad about him. Everyone is so like taken by him. But once you get to know him personally or closely, that's when you see the true, you know, like self and how aggressive and, and how violent he is. So how, how do you, I don't know, like the girl doesn't want to believe that he's bad. Her parents are actually putting her down and telling her that this is the best relationship you've ever had. Um, and only the friends are seeing, know what happens in reality and they don't know what to do to help. Any yeah. advice? They came to me for advice. I gave them advice. It worked for a little bit, but then it went back. So I'm going, okay, I don't know how to help you, you know? It is, it's hard. I think the most important thing is to stay, stay connected to that girl and stay supportive. Um, there, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head what the stat is today, but when I went through recruit class 16 years ago, the stat was a woman or like, a victim, usually the woman, is abused a minimum of seven times before she reports. Oh my God. Right? And I think that is higher now. I think that, especially in the times of COVID, when we are more confined in a smaller group, we're not seeing as many people. So we're kind of losing confidence in ourselves and second guessing our, our gut instincts, right? Um, that if the friends are observing something, it's probably happening. But yes, the girl probably doesn't want to do anything because she's scared or she doesn't know and she doesn't want to lose a relationship with parents, all that kind of stuff. The best thing to do is keep being supportive um, because even if we piled a whole bunch of resources in front of the girl, we can't force her to get help. Yeah. You can't force someone to get healthy if they want to be unwell. Like if you had a mental health disorder, you were bipolar, well, I can't force pills down your throat to make sure that your baseline stays the same. That actually would violate that person's human rights. Um, so it's a really fine line. The person has to want to get help and they have to be ready to get help. So if she chooses one day or she wakes up and realizes what a bad situation she's in, she's going to need people to support her and, and walk with her to get that help. So those friends are just going to need to be by her side. But, you know, at the same time, a text occasionally about, hey, have you tried calling 211? Or, hey, did you know that IFSA has this support group? Or, I'm going to go check out this mental health webinar. Do you want to do it with me? Those kinds of gentle suggestions without being too forceful, because that can push people away. Okay. Interesting. Uh, Jackie, if I have a neighbor who is very bad, bias who doesn't like this group or that group and giving you know um, my children and I very difficult you know making our life you know something calling police on uh, you know how to deal with those bad neighbors that is tricky we do get a lot of neighbor complaints um, and they don't necessarily always warrant police involvement. Um, if the neighbors are not getting along and it's continuing to, to um, get worse, so they're calling the children bad names or the neighbors bad names, we try to refer people to mediation or like the alternative dispute resolution program. Uh, we can write the referral or make the referral for the two neighbors, but they have to be willing to participate. That's always the hard part. And you can't, you know, you, you can't fight a war with just one person, right? So you need, you need to fix it with two people or two parties that want to communicate and do better. If that's still not a possibility uh, and the neighbors are still fighting or one is still being aggressive towards the other person, you could go to court and get a restraining order. Um, it's a bit tricky and sometimes for some you have to hire a lawyer uh, but you could get a court order so that they could have no contact with you. And if they continued after they were served with the restraining order to have contact with you, then you could phone the police and we could, we could arrest them for the breach of the restraining order. But 
that breach just means that they have to tell a judge why they were being such a jerk. It doesn't mean that they're going to jail. And even if you did that, it doesn't always help the relationship. So the first step is always trying to communicate and mediate. So police, get, you could call the police and we could go and talk to the neighbor and say, hey, the things that you're saying are really mean and hurtful. That's not appropriate. Do you think you can stop? And if they're willing, great. If they're not, then it's kind of a waste of time. The neighbor that's the victim should be documenting everything. Uh, so writing it all down, the date, the time, the words that are being said. You could also get some video surveillance, so like a um, the video doorbell or stuff like that, so you could record it because then you have some evidence. But it it is tricky. There's a I feel like I'm not giving you good answers. You're asking. No, no, no it's, it's good. It's, it's really good. Okay. Uh, also, I was asking another question. A mom is saying that her 16 years old or 17. I mean, he doesn't go to school, he, he does uh, shisha, he does something at home, and she doesn't want to, you know, um, you know, to, to, I mean, to ask him to, to leave the house because she's worried about out there, what could be something worse out there. I, I mean, the friend is, could be a bad friend to go back home, you, you call the neighbor, I mean, the relative or the police that you know, they come home and they just, you know, threaten him, but here you can't call the police, you know, to talk to him, uh, only you. So how to deal with a teenager who is, you know, defiant like this? Because some parents are having difficulties. Yeah. You know, if they were still in school, if they were in high school and they were still in school, my recommendation would be to talk to the school resource officer because they're at the school every day. Um, and they see them. And there's also other resources like, I mean, Ali, you're my go-to when I know that there's a problem in community. I would, as a police officer, I call you or another community elder or, you know, Muna at East Glen. Like without the kids being in school, we, we kind of lose touch with our resources, but the school resource officers that were in the public schools that are not anymore, they are working right now in a youth, uh, youth enhanced deployment model. So they're still actually working on the street and schools can contact the constables to go follow up with some of their students. So maybe that mom could call the school and say, hey, is there someone that you could refer me to to talk to? Um, I know at, uh, at Queen E, there's the Roger Project. Those guys are still around. Um, maybe at Emmy Lizert, I'm not sure what they have there. Um, there's success coaches from the family center as well. Some of those guys work in the schools. Um, I'm not sure so much about what's on the south side, but you know, we would try to connect them with resources. And if they were really, really uh, worried about their kid, they could call the police. It would. It's not an emergency, so we would take a while to get there. Um, but you could, they could also reach out to someone like me and I would try at, or send one of the community engagement constables to go out and talk to them face to face, see what the problem is. It's, there's a lot of violence happening right now. It's kind of scary out there. Thank you. Can uh, the mother call 211? Like do yep. you think can can she call 211 and ask for help or someone to talk to so they can tell her what to do? Yep, absolutely. 211 is available for anyone, and 211 is in the whole province now. Hello, Jackie. Good evening. Hello. Jabril here. How are you? I'm good, Jabril. Nice to hear from you. Yeah, nice to hear from you as well. So, you know, uh, COVID 19, everybody's just hiding place. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, the, the question that I have uh, is uh, from time to time, you know, community leaders will get the question from the community members. And it could be a weekend, maybe Saturday, maybe Sunday. Some mothers are worried something has taken place. And what would be the best way to get, you know, I remember at one time I called you, but that weekend, maybe you were on vacation or something. Yeah. I had to call Darren, but uh, 
you know, I think he called me back a couple hours after. That was that was great actually to hear back from him. And so we we always get questions because things can happen, you know, over the weekend, maybe Friday evening. So, what's your take on that side of it? Well, there it is. I'm just pulling it up. Um, there is a new area called help. And I'm just looking it up to see if there's a phone number that I can give to you. Well, we don't want to talk to unknown face. We, we need to talk to maybe Jackie or someone like you. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. I yeah. wish I could be there 24-7. Okay. Um, there's a new, there's a new area in the community and self community safety well-being branch. Yes. And Dave Veach is the deputy chief there, but right now Anina is the acting director, acting something. Ex executive director, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, he is the, he's executive director already, but he's in um, Dave Veach's spot right now. I just can't remember what the title is for that rank. Um, right. And in that area is this place, a unit called HELP, Human Centered uh, See, Engagement. You know they, they work 24 seven. The reason that I mentioned this is that EPS, if they need to talk to community leaders like me, my, I'm, I'm available. What happened here? Okay. Uh, you know, I remember uh, Brian Simpson when he was the deputy police. Yeah, you remember that incident at the West Edmonton Mall, right? Yeah. yeah. He, he called me 7 o'clock in the morning to let me know what's happening, right? So since we are making ourselves available to EBS, instead of talking to some unknown faces, you know, might be, might be that person should be introduced. So when we call them, they know who's calling kind of thing. So that this becomes a... Uh, both ways of communication and, and, and using one another in terms of helping and, you know, kind of things. That's, that's what I was thinking about. Yeah, sorry. No, Jabril, I totally agree with you. It's when we, when I don't want to say we lost Brian because he didn't pass away or anything, but when Brian retired, yes. that style of policing yeah. kind of went with him. Oh, I see. Okay. And like that, that connection and relationship right and same with terry rocchio he was the same way yeah he, he really believed in the value of, of creating relationships and supporting those relationships to make sure that they're healthy okay and so we when we lost those couple good guys um you know chelsea and i and you seen we're trying to we're trying to teach other people that are above us in rank how to do it but because yeah. we're below them sometimes it doesn't always work and <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think the chief is, um, he's also about building relationships, but he's, he's trying to please a lot of people right now and it's hard to spread himself so thin. And so yeah. we're working really hard to fill in the gaps, but. So where is, where is Terry, and Terry uh, Rocchio? Is he, is he gone? Yep. He retired. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh yep. my goodness. And wow. so did just in the last um, two weeks ago, 27 yeah. senior people retired. So Brad Doucette retired and he was the co-chair of our sexual gender committee. Like same what you were on the African committee with Darren. Um, so Brad Doucette is gone after 35 years. Um, Trent Forsberg, superintendent, uh, yeah. he's gone he retired um mm -hmm. lo lots of people that had 25 to 30 years retired oh i see okay wow. yeah that's that's the question that you know uh, i i don't i cannot control what what what time i get the call from the community members right so <laughs> and i have to have the answer and i sometimes a lot of times i don't have the answers right so yeah know, make, yeah and and you know what jabril you're a lot because we all of you, even you, Moran, we, and Ali, yeah. we go to you guys an awful lot and we don't right. give back the same way. You're allowed to say no. And, and I know I'm one of those people that calls you all the time, but you're allowed to say no. And I, I want you to, to 
protect yourselves and take care of yourselves first, because until the police service, and I'm speaking as the as Jackie, not the organization, until they learn how to treat people better, you're, you know, we're not going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. Okay. But Jackie, okay. we can never say no to you. You're too oh, sweet. <laughs> you, you have no idea how much I miss <laughs> being out in community and hugging people and mm -hmm. like laughing and joking and yeah. I it know. makes my heart beat. I'm so sad to be at home. Yeah. I, I just want to. I, I just want to take this opportunity to thank you for coming tonight and uh, giving us a little bit more information as as a community members kind of things and also you are you are a wonderful person, Jackie. That you always are part of the community. You always come back. And you always try to give information. So thank you so much for that. You know, so, yeah. Thank you, Jabril. That means a lot to me. Yeah, it is true. And I'll second that. I'll sort it. I'll I'll go times 100 <laughs> what he said <laughs> it's true jackie i do miss you i do miss you quite a bit like and and i do understand when you say i do miss the hugging the people and being with them and laughing and whatever and even just working together like just passing by the office or you know like to to see us or to discuss something but in person it does you know you do miss that and i do miss that quite a bit too so COVID, COVID has taught us uh, something called the virtual hugging. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. virtual <laughs> hugging. Yes, George. Yeah. I do this a lot. I make a heart with my hands. Yeah, I know. I know. It's it's too bad. It's really too bad. Yeah, and I I worry about people because, um, you know, we're not having these meetings or connections as often, and so. Maybe they, they, they're too scared to ask questions or they don't know where to get the information and then something bad might happen that we could have prevented. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Do you still have your uh, 5O unit? The Wi-Fi O unit, yep, they're still around. They're still around. Okay. Yeah, I don't I work out of the TD Tower now. So I don't oh, see really? Them. Yeah. The TD Tower is sort of our new headquarters. Um, the, that's where the chief works out of and our corporate comms and media, uh, payroll, our community relations section, which is just me, Chelsea and Yasin. Um, that we all work out of the tower. It feels really weird. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're all kind of like excluded in there on your own. So yeah, there's no police officer. Well, other than the white shirts and myself, there's not really any police officers that work there. And so I feel like, I feel like kind of like a grown up in the real job. <laughs> <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Yeah, so. Um, how are you guys though? How is like, how is your community? How are your clients, your friends, your families? I'll let you well, uh, we we have lost a few of our community members uh, due to COVID nineteen. A number of them get sick, but they went through. So I think overall here in Alberta, we we are doing okay. I believe uh, so. So far, so good. Uh, we are still struggling. Community. Your voice cut off. Yeah, I know. I'm having an issue with my uh, Wi-Fi, so that's the reason why. In any case, uh, I think uh, Jackie, we're, we're doing okay. We the community is doing okay, so we're doing okay. So yeah, yeah. But uh, the struggle for Alberta is jobs, right? So a lot yeah. of people have lost their jobs, and uh, I think we're not doing uh, uh, you know good in, in terms of uh, jobs and you know the the the, the economy is not doing well. I hope that uh, you know 2021 will be much better. But uh, this year we have to count our blessings and, uh, and and appreciate the community and appreciate the families. We cannot complain at all as long as we are. We wake up in the morning and we are healthy. So that's the way that I see things. So, how about you, uh, Jackie? Yourself and the family. Um. been a really rough year 
Oh. Yeah, yeah. It is tough times for all of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's I'm not sorry. it's not bad things. I promise. I just it's hard to always be like professional, right? Like my mom had yeah. a stroke at the beginning of COVID and she was oh. in the hospital and I had to go home and take care of her to get her out because there was so much COVID. And and she's right. doing much, much better, but she's also on my every last nerve because she's 70 and she wants to be very busy and she wants to go get groceries and she wants to go volunteer. And I'm like, you're not safe, mom, stop. And, and she's in Calgary. And then, you know, my kids here are my, my youngest boy. He's had five or six COVID tests already because so many kids in his school were getting sick. And then I got sick. It wasn't COVID. And then, you know, it kind of broke my heart. We did that pop-up community event at, yeah. uh, at Village Acres there. And, you know, I took a picture with some folks and yeah. one of the gentlemen next to me passed away. Yeah, oh my goodness. See, we are not aware of all of that because of we haven't seen each other for a long time. So I'm so sorry to hear that. Uh, that uh, I hope uh, we wish your mommy a, a, a, a fast recovery. Hopefully she's going to be okay. Thank I know you. the challenge, you know, uh, but... Uh, you know, we're all going to go through these tough times for sure. So yeah, it is. And, and my, my tough times are not any better or worse than anybody else's. I just, I just know yeah. everybody is, is hurting and that is hard. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is tough time for sure. You know, so. Yeah, it is. So much of my energy comes from taking care of other people and I feel a little bit lost. Trust me, you're not the only one there because I do know yeah. exactly. Yeah, uh, you yeah, are yeah. a people person, and you're so warm and so giving, and that's it. If you don't have the people around you, yeah, yeah you don't yeah, know yeah. what to do. So, and I yeah. agree with you. COVID is is really hurting our mental health. Yeah. It's really affecting us. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but definitely, definitely. you can still go have a coffee with someone or to a restaurant to have lunch or dinner or <laughs> so so at least think of that positive thought and plan it yes i will with you yes i hope so <laughs> people are people are having an online zoom through zoom yeah yeah <laughs> we could do that too i have my i have a coffee Oh. <laughs> All right, so uh, do we have any other questions? I don't know if there is anything else, Jackie, you would like to add for your presentation. Um, um, the, there is one thing, and we can do this another time, but um, you, maybe some people have heard about our commitment to action um, and great engagement strategy. And it's about listening to community to, to, for their suggestions and recommendations on what we could do better, not doing another consultation like we've done to, with community so many times and nothing happened. Um, our next session is December 8th and I can send you guys a link to register if you wanted. We're planning these listening sessions mostly on Zoom right now, but the chief is there, Anina is there, our, like our chain of command is there and Basically, we're asking community three questions, and the questions are, um, who are you? Like, what's your name? What community are you from? And what has your experience been like with police for either you or your family? And what recommendations or suggestions would you like to make to us to help us be better? And in the four sessions that we've already done, they're about two hours, two and a half hours, and we do them it's harder on Zoom, but we do them with everybody sitting in a circle. Uh, if we were in public, when we're doing them on Zoom, we have a moderator from Professional Standards Branch. Her name is Donna. Um, she will go through and ask everybody on the Zoom. And we're hearing a lot of um, things around customer service. We're hearing a lot of things around accountability and transparency, um, better training, and because the chief is there at the table in the room, he's also hearing it directly from community because quite often when Chelsea and I make our recommendations up 
the chain of command, it doesn't carry the same weight. But when the chief has to look at someone face to face and hear their heartbreak, then it makes a bigger impact. And so, you know, if, if your group wanted to, like if your association wanted to have a listening session, um, you could set it up with me and we could, we could do the same questions and everybody would have a turn to talk. Um, and I would be, we would be fur furiously writing notes about everything. One of the su suggestions that I wanted to let you know about that happened at our first session was that one of our community partners, um, and Jabril, you might remember her, Carrie Thomason, she used to work for Métis Child and Family Services and she sat on our Indigenous committee. Right. Her yeah, so her recommendation was that police officers should have to do some shifts with community stakeholders so that they understand the work that they do and they understand the clients that they serve. And right. so I put together a proposal like the chief just looked at me and said, okay, make it happen. I'm like, ah, uh, okay. And I start typing, but I put together a proposal that recruits when they're in block two. So block one is when they're in training in the classroom. Block two is when they're with a training officer on the street. When they're in that session or section of their training, they will have to do a minimum of two shifts with a community partner as a student, not as a cop. So you know, maybe they would have to go to the Africa Center or they would have to go to Boyle Street or the Bissell and they would work with one of the outreach workers there to observe them for one day. And then the next day they would have to do tasks assigned to them by the worker. If it's making sandwiches or helping someone get ID or helping someone go to Alberta Works to fill out the paperwork to get funding, they, the police officer would have to be the outreach worker. And they're not allowed to say that they're a police officer. They have to follow their directions from the outreach person. And they have to then present back to the recruit class a character study of a client that they met without identifying them, but they have to, they have to understand somebody's trauma and their lived experience and why they're where they're at in their life. And so to do that, they have to ask them questions. They have to sit on a bench or a chair next to that person and learn about them as a human being. And yeah. then they have to present that back to the recruit class. And they also have to put together a database for the class of all of the agencies and what services they provide. So that when they go out on the street, they don't, they don't just take someone to jail because they have nowhere else to take them. They can go to their database that they put together as a group and to say, you know, this person's intoxicated. They need a warm place to stay. I can take them to the George Spady or you know, um, they live on the north side and they're Muslim, maybe I could take them to Islamic Family Social Services because there's a food bank outlet up there. So that's, that's what I put together. And um, right now I'm socializing it with different community partners. And we're gonna, we have to do some legal stuff like a letter of understanding, um, but it should be ready to go for the next recruit class that starts in February. Actually, uh, there's, uh, and we are reviewing now the police act. I'm a member of the committee. And one of the recommendations that we made is that the new recruits, when they graduate, they're going to be tied to a community so that, you know, they will be working with them for a while to understand. So at least they understand, you know, what kind of community they're going to be serving to give them a little more practical experience. That's one of the recommendations that, you know, we have over the provider. I am so glad that you told me that because I can put that in my briefing note up the chain of command to get more yeah. leverage to have it approved. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> so that's good for me. Yeah, I'm right yeah, yeah. Right. And maybe I can work that into my proposal too. Yes, definitely, yeah. Yeah, so if you guys wanted to have a session just for um, your group, we can do that and it can be dedicated all to that and, and maybe there's more ideas that you might have. Actually, there are members of the EPS attending that meeting. They are, yes, part the, they are part of the group that we are in who are reviewing the police act, yeah. Yeah. yeah. There's uh, some police association members like uh, Mike Elliott and Curtis Hoople, I think are on that. Uh, Jackie, how many people would you require to do a session like this? Doesn't matter. Uh, for, uh, you know, Jackie, thank you so much for that. Yeah. You're welcome. And it could be any community, right? Any community. 
yeah, it, it, you know, if you just want to have one, we can just set one up for, you know, if you want to do something in February for Black History Month and kind of talk about that and then talk about ways that we can be better. Mm. Absolutely. We can advertise it for you. We would do it registration through Eventbrite or you guys could do the registration. It, it doesn't matter. We also have a small honorarium so that um, maybe if by February or January, well, I'm trying to be optimistic, but if we were to be able to gather in person, you know, we have a little bit of money to rent a space or to get some refreshments or something like that. But if we're doing it on Zoom, yeah, we, we wouldn't necessarily need that, but. Would you do it for the Francophone community? Yes. We would just need to have someone that speaks French from our end. Because <laughs> that's not me. The only French I know is bad words. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I'm not going to get in trouble. Well, I probably would. <laughs> you know, we also, I should send you, the Chief and Anina and I did a podcast with uh, the Comedio Studio, which is in behind the Habisha Market on 107th Avenue. And it's kind of, it's kind, it was kind of fun, actually. We've never done anything like that before. So if there's ways we could think outside the box to do more fun engagement with the big guy or me, we're all for it. Okay. I will uh, brainstorm with Jabril about some stuff and, and let's uh, try to do at least one session with you, as you're saying, in, uh, in the new year. That would be great just to to see, you know, like how the police listens um, to the community and they actually are trying to effect change. So uh, that would be great, actually. Yeah, there's in the spring or February, January, February, similar to um, the Police Act review. So I think something that came out of there was a Know Your Rights card or information. And we've been working on that, too. So that's coming out shortly. Okay. So those are... Those are finally some actual things are happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah, wow, wow. Yeah. That's, this is actually great news because I remember in the past, we were barely doing just training for the police. Like we're saying, yeah, just do training, just do training. Now you're actually doing something which is great. That's amazing, so. Yeah, it, you know, for like, some of you long haulers, you and Jabril, it feels like you've probably been waiting forever for something to change. Um, but it, it does feel nice that there's actual movement. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. Well, I'm gonna spam you with emails now with all of the links to our webpage. Hey, I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I don't know, do we have any questions from the community or from participants? If you would like to ask Jackie one last question. No. Very quiet group tonight. Yes, I'm sorry about that, but okay. you can, actually they, most of them, they, they ask Ali Mahdi, that's why he keeps on asking all the questions and, and he kind of asks them, so. Uh, a lot of people wouldn't like to speak and they ask him to speak on their behalf, so. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. And so. I talk really fast. No, you're, you're fine, you're <laughs> fine. <laughs> All right, well, um, seriously, on behalf of the Somali Canadian Cultural Society of Edmonton and on behalf of Jibril, on behalf of me, everybody, thank you. Thank you so much for an amazing, session I learned okay. stuff and I have been here for years so I was actually surprised you know about certain points that you mentioned and uh, and I think this is valuable we should do that more often you know because mm -hmm. there is always something new that happens and there is always something you know a connection whatever so really yeah fun. absolutely and if you know if you're if you guys wanted to send in your questions maybe to Anna to collect all together and send to me beforehand then um, I would be able to like go through them one by one and then open up the floor again too. That's something we can do. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Jackie. Thank you. You're welcome, Jabril. Take care. Yeah, I will leave it to Anna to do the closing. So I don't know if Anna, you have anything to say 
but uh, Jackie, I will be in touch with you personally and uh, we definitely will connect. Thank you. Thank you. Go um, ahead. Yeah, I'd just like to say on behalf of the community, again, thank you so much for coming out and sharing your knowledge and your insights. And also thank you to all the participants who came out today. I hope that you guys know, I believe that you guys were able to learn and gain support from this session. So we have more upcoming sessions on different topics in the other week, in the upcoming weeks. So if the participants would like to join those as well, that would be wonderful. And also, uh, if you have any questions, send them to me and I will send them with Jackie and we'll stay in contact. But thank you so much for coming out and presenting and sharing your knowledge with us today. You're thank very you welcome. so much. Thank you so much, Anne, for organizing uh, the uh, evening. So thank you so much for that. Also. Oh, no worries. Thank you. Thank you, Milan, also, and, and everybody who attended. So, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Jibril. Thank you, Jackie. You're thank welcome. You. Take care of yourself, and and uh, I will send you an email. And please respond. Yes, I will. I, I will. will the other guy now. I will. I will connect with you, Jackie. Also, I will call you. Okay. Thank you. So yeah, much. for sure. Okay. All right. Stay, stay healthy, everybody. Yes. Thank you. you too. Bye. Bye. Stay, stay safe. Thank you. Bye, bye, guys. Thank you.